Hi, uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name's Katie Thompson. I'm the head of the Rule of Law, Security and Human Rights team of UNDP, based in headquarters in New York. Hope you're all well this morning. We're really happy to have you all online. Just going to say a few words of, of introduction to this session on business, human rights, and conflict-affected region, regions um, towards heightened action. We have a great set of panelists to hear from today, um, and we really hope to be able to make the conversation as interactive as is possible on these virtual platforms. So we welcome you to ask questions or make comments in the chat format. We'll be monitoring that closely and aim to make it as interactive as we can and to make, try and make sure that we hear your perspectives, your questions, and try and create the time for responses to those. So please do use that um, very actively. Um, we are aiming and we hope to have online around 400, at least 400 people today. Um, this is a really significant area of action for UNDP. And we know that there's a high level of interest from civil society, from governments, from member states, and from, from UNDP staff, as well as from other UN colleagues. And, and the, the diversity of registrations and representation in this group is part, um, shows the significance of the, uh, of the issue. We're going to dive into some depth around how working on business and human rights in conflict affected regions is important, how we need to calibrate, how we engage in, in conflict or risky settings where situations um, where people are at risk of violence or at risk of human rights abuses. And we're going to try and get into some detail around that topic and hear from different perspectives from around the planet, Africa, Asia, and of course, um, and, and from developed settings. Um, we have our Canadian colleague who's going to speak on the perspectives um, of, of a partner country. Now, um, without further ado, what I'm going to do first is to, is to introduce um, ASG Asako Okai, who is the Assistant Secretary General of the Crisis Bureau of UNDP. And she's going to make the first in introduction to this conversation, followed by Professor Anita Ramasastri, who will be outlining um, her study on this issue. After that, the panelists will present and then we'll move on to the Q&A. Um, and we should then have around half an hour for you to post your comments. And as I mentioned, please do that actively. And I will attempt to moderate and make sure the, the panelists get the opportunity to respond. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to pass the floor to Assistant Secretary General Asako Okai and ask her to open. Thanks so much. Thank you, Katie. Distinguished participants, colleagues, and friends, warm welcome to all. This is going to be a very exciting session for you. So please allow me to begin by thanking our keynote speaker, Professor Anita Lamasasli of the UN Working Group on Business and Human Rights, as well as our discussants for joining us to chart the next steps on the relationship between business, human rights, and conflict. Businesses can play a large role during security crisis and in their aftermath, while they can make positive contributions and be engine of peace and development, they can also fuel conflict. Recent events have reminded us of this deadly attacks by violent extremists in Mozambique in March this year uh, in the northern part of the country have been linked to the exploitation of natural resources and related investments. In Myanmar, further to the call of the UN Secretary General for a reversal of the coup, many concerned businesses spoke publicly about the shrinking of democratic space and reiterated their responsibility to respect international human rights standards. It is critical that the words are followed by concrete actions that help to protect human rights and return the country on the path of democracy. These include adopting measures to protect employees from the excesses of the security forces, a fundamental duty of care, and to ensure that business operations don't lend legitimacy to those who are violating human rights. These obligations are clearly outlined in the guiding principles on business and human rights. Distinguished participants, business, businesses 
do have responsibilities, particularly in conflict settings. Milton Friedman's old adage that the business of business is business is no longer holds. The framework set out by the UN Working Group on Business and Human Rights demands us to apply a systematic approach to promote links between business activity, human rights abuses, and conflict prevention. But we have not yet effectively captured this across the UN system. UNDP thus decided to take the lead on making those connections and to craft a coherent shared agenda. In early March, UNDP organized its first annual Global Prevention in Action Forum as the opening of this development dialogue series on rethinking solutions to crisis in the decade of action. We brought together policymakers, practitioners, and researchers for a forward-looking discussion on prevention and peace building. This is a part of our efforts to articulate UNDP's prevention offer, anchored in the Secretary General's prevention agenda, and then imperative to achieve the SDGs. We are determined to make ourselves fit for providing integrated development solutions to complex problems based on data, analysis, and evidence, and to be able to act early at scale with partners in the face of multidimensional risks and conflict. In the session focusing on the role of the private sector in conflict prevention and peace building, many participants highlighted the validity of bringing business and human rights perspectives into action. The key message from the discussion is as follows. The private sector in conflict settings need to be guided towards positive action for peace. We need to make sure that the private sector utilizes the do no harm approach and operate in a conflict sensitive manner to minimize their negative impact. For example, they should engage in human rights due diligence, a responsibility which is heightened during conflicts. They should seek out advice from actors such as the United Nations to understand conflict dynamics and participate in efforts to de-escalate crisis situations. They should engage with transitional justice processes once hostilities are over. Undertake uh, reparations and other measures if called on to show accountability for their actions. They can contribute in building a peaceful and inclusive society by influencing policies, for example, against discrimination. The working group reports calls on UNDP and the broader UN family to ensure that we do not work in silos and that we integrate awareness on business, human rights, and conflict into our peace and security architecture. Through implementation of the prevention offer and building on the key messages of the prevention forum, UNDP will strengthen its engagement with the private sector as well as the diverse partners to achieve this imperative. In particular, UNDP, in a strong collaboration with the working group and in consultation with businesses, intends to develop a toolkit on heightened human rights due diligence to guide businesses on how to respect human rights and manage risks in conflict settings. The working group also calls on all stakeholders to work together through a forum for exchanging best practices. Distinguished participants, the time is ripe for such cooperation. It is only through broad collaboration within and outside our organization that we can ensure that all businesses play a constructive role in conflicts and ensure future stability and prosperity for all. Thank you very much for your attention. Over back to you, Katie. Thank you. Thank you, Osako, for those words. Um, as we've heard, this, this area of business and human rights, and in particular working in the context of prevention and support to people living in conflict-affected settings, is a real priority for UNDP. I now have uh, the pleasure of introducing uh, Professor Anita Ramasastri, who is going to provide an in-depth presentation on, on, her, uh, on her report. Um, now, the report on business and human rights conflict affected regions towards heightened actions is particularly important to us, not least because 
um, the professor is a great partner of UNDP and working really closely with us um, on the human rights due diligence that has been mentioned. Um, and as part of the UN working group on business and human rights, has been a tremendous, uh, tremendously important stakeholder in this effort with us. Um, she is a, a professor at the University of Washington based in Seattle and also a member of the working group on business and human rights. Um, Anita, I believe you will be uh, presenting to us very shortly. There you are. That's great to see you. Um, uh, thanks so much for working with us so closely on this work on human rights due diligence, particularly important for us in implementing this program. Um, and of course, I just also want to note the drafting of the roadmap on the implementation of the guiding principles for the next decade, which is also the same decade that we're driving forward for the SDGs. So this is also a particularly important coincidence for us. Without further ado, I'm going to hand over to you. You have 15 minutes to present, so we look forward to hearing all uh, the details. Great. Thank you so much, Katie. Um, Assistant Secretary Okai, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much to UNDP for hosting this important discussion, but more importantly, for your leadership and partnership on this issue of business, human rights, and conflict-affected areas. I'm delighted to hear of the priority that you've made uh, with this topic. Now the working group, uh, the UN Working Group on Business and Human Rights is the guardian of the guiding principles on business and human rights. We are tasked by the Human Rights Council for implementing this internationally accepted and authoritative standard and promoting business respect for human rights globally. As Assistant Secretary Okai and Katie mentioned in October of 2020, we presented a report to the General Assembly focused on business, human rights and conflict affected areas towards heightened action. My remarks are really just to help set the stage. I think the Assistant Secretary did a great job of explaining, we find ourselves once again in a context where the connection between business and conflict is very real. And we'll hear from discussants about what that looks like today and where we need to go. But I'm gonna just explain a little bit of the rationale. Why did the working group write the report that it did in partnership with, with organizations and entities, including UNDP, who supported our multi-stakeholder consultation in regions throughout the world. What did we recommend in, in the broadest sense? What, what, what have we called for in our call to action? And then I look forward to hearing from the discussants about how do we make this agenda as real as possible. Now, the business and human rights movement has came of age. We have, we're about to celebrate the 10th anniversary of the UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights, but the business and human rights movement is a little bit early, older and earlier, and it came of age at a time when business was implicated in conflict in different parts of the globe for many different issues, including issues relating to natural resource extraction. Some of you may remember, especially those of you working in the business and peace area, there were questions about how natural resource extraction fueled conflict, and you heard about that from the Assistant Secretary. We looked at books and research such as Greed and Grievance and Beyond Greed and Grievance, and we had discussion of so-called conflict commodities. We looked at regions such as Colombia, Indonesia, Sierra Leone, and if we step back even further in time, we can think about even the role of business in Northern Ireland and the development of the McBride principles, particularly because of this idea that I really want to underscore today, which is that business is not neutral when it is engaged in its activity in a conflict or post-conflict setting. It, its mere presence is not neutral. And while business can be, as we've heard, a force for good, for peace and for sustainable development, we believe it can only do so if it is aware not only of the positive contributions it can make, but also of the uh, possibility and the heightened risk for actually being connected to human rights abuses and to harm as well. So understanding the positives where I think in the peace building community and focusing on prevention, there's been much more of this assumption, whereas we need to step back and think about also the idea of the guiding principles that business engages in human rights due diligence so that it actually does no harm. So the guiding principles themselves already mention conflict. As I mentioned before, the guiding principles and business and human rights were sort of born out of an era of business, human rights and conflict. And guiding principle seven in particular mentions that states should provide additional uh, support, guidance, tools and resources to help businesses actually engage in conflict affected areas because of the risk of gross human rights abuses that are heightened in conflict areas. 
and the guiding principle seven and the commentary, which I would encourage everyone to read, really talks about how states need to support business and engage at the earliest stage possible with business enterprises to help them to identify, to prevent, and to mitigate these heightened human rights risks. In addition, the guiding principles mentioned that in situations of internal armed conflict or armed conflict, enterprises need to respect the standards of international humanitarian law. And there's also reference to international criminal law as well. So there is this need because of the heightened risk to people of gross human rights abuses that states and business really operate to, to deal with the, these concerns. But since the impl implementation of the guiding principles, so we're now talking about nearly a decade, there's been relatively little guidance on the role of the guiding principles and of states and business in this conflict affected, in conflict affected regions. So the working group's report was basically picking up where the guiding principles left off. And we attempt to unpack guiding principle seven and say, what further needs to be done to help business respect human rights in conflict affected areas? And as I mentioned before, as we unpack guiding principle seven, we really focus on this idea that business needs to understand drivers of conflict and to create plans and strategies that take into account the conflict context. And up until now, I think there, there's been little to help business do that effectively. So that is why we engaged in this report. And I think we'll hear a little bit more of the rationale as we hear from discussants, because we are not in a world that is full of peace and stability. In fact, we're in a world where conflict continues and there are many fragile and complex environments in which business operates. And, and, and we heard about M Myanmar and Mozambique. So how? Our report calls for heightened action. And I'll first speak about what that means in terms of business. We ask business to engage in what we call heightened or enhanced human rights due diligence. Human rights due diligence is really a process by which businesses identify those risks or harms to people that may arise from their business operations, whether it's supply chains, or sourcing a conflict commodity, or operating on the ground in a situation where there may be fragility or conflict. But heightened human rights due diligence asks businesses to do more than ask questions about traditional human rights issues of workplace health and safety and can workers unionize uh, beyond sort of traditional issues and to really look at what we call triggers and indicators. To basically be aware in certain kinds of situations and there are different ones, some of those situations may be situations where there's intra-community conflict. At a project or site level, conflict can arise and we ask business to be aware of underlying triggers or indicators that might, might lead us to believe that there's a heightened risk of conflict. Similarly, if business is operating in a situation of internal conflict, again, what are the triggers or indicators that might mean that you need heightened or enhanced human rights due diligence? And finally, we also believe this is important in post-conflict settings as well, that businesses need to take into account the conflict context. How will they do this? We talk about triggers and indicators and we refer to, for example, atrocity prevention as a useful tool or guide for understanding in these different contexts, what are risks that businesses should pay attention to that are precursors of when conflict may arise. In addition to that, we really call on companies to engage in contextual risk assessment. This is what the international financial institutions call it, but we call it heightened human rights due diligence. Using conflict sensitivity to understand the drivers of conflict. Who are the parties to the conflict or who were the parties to the conflict? What are the underlying factors that get, get, may give rise to violence? Different rights may be at play depending on the nature of a conflict. Ordinary human rights due diligence doesn't always get into that. This may relate to issues of minority rights, issue of land rights, concern over natural resources. We, there are many different issues that when seen through a conflict lens become salient human rights risks, but weren't before. There's also a greater challenge in a conflict context of consultation and engagement with stakeholders. We encourage business to engage actively with and, and, and affirmatively and as early as possible with stakeholders. And if it's not possible to engage in a traditional manner with stakeholders, then it is important for, for business to find out how to find trusted partners and allies in and outside of that difficult environment in order to truly understand what the scenario. So merging or using different fields, <clears throat> business and peace, conflict prevention, 
using those tools and embedding them in human rights due diligence is our key message. And in post-conflict, our message is that investment is not just about doing good. It is also about predicting and, and, and ensuring that you have contingency plans and you anticipate the harm that may occur because there is still a fragile environment in a post-conflict setting. I'll conclude by saying that our report also has recommendations for states. States also need to engage in heightened action by providing business with guidance and support that they need in situ situations of conflict. This relates to developing intelligence and, and material that will guide business in these different settings, both locally and more globally, providing training not only to, to business, but to state officials and, and people working in embassies and missions, and really being able to work in active partnership around what are tools and solutions that take into, effect, into account conflict contexts. For the UN bodies, I congratulate UNDP for being really a leader here, but we really looked and said, there is no UN roadmap. Business and human rights has not been part of the peace and security architecture, and we believe firmly that it needs to be. So UNDP, but the Peace Building Support Office, the Peace Building Commission, we would look at many other parts of the UN and say, please embed the guiding principles and this concept of human rights due diligence into your own work and your playbooks. And finally, two last points. On access to remedy, as we heard earlier, transitional justice is important and business has often been implicated in issues of serious human rights harms. We would say that we need to look at how transitional justice processes and the UN guiding principles and access to effective remedy, how do these two areas coexist and how do we develop processes and frameworks for how business should participate in transitional justice. Finally, one area that is still, we need much more guidance in gray zone is that business must often engage with armed non-state actors while they are operating on the ground. We know and we, we, we should encourage business to tread very carefully, but very often they must engage in the sense that they are present and operating where those groups are. What should this look like and how do we help business respect human rights in those contexts is an open issue that I think we all need to tackle. I wanna thank you again for this opportunity and I look forward to hearing from the discussants. Thanks so much. Thanks so much, Anita. Um, I really appreciate the fact that you're you're connecting this to this broader engagement uh, within the development sphere on other rule of law uh, processes that take place that are around peace, reconciliation, the reestablishment of rule of law and human rights in conflict contexts, highlighting transitional justice, which is a particularly complex area anyway, but it's traditionally understood as the realm between state and community, but introducing the private sector and the obligations to consider how they engage in such a process is, is, is really important uh, and, and shows the breadth and multidimensionality of, of the guiding principles and of what's actually needed for businesses to show uh, corporate accountability. Very interesting, thanks so much. I'm going to turn now to Abia Donbeewu, who's the Executive Director of Global Rights. Um, she coordinates a number of different programs that broad and uh, are a broad spread across access to justice, women's rights, um, working on natural resources and governance, security and governance. Um, she's also the co-chair of the steering committee of the African Coalition for Corporate Accountability. Um, what's great about this presentation is that she will be able to take this overall analysis Anita has uh, provided us with and make it applicable for us in the context of the African continent and her work there. Um, and she will also be able to talk to us about um, the impact on women and the, in, the impact of, of, of um, abuses on conflict abuses on women, on marginalized groups um, within the context uh, and victims of discrimination within the context that she's been working. Um, so we really look forward to hearing from you, Abiodon. I don't uh, see you on there you are, that's great. So please, we're really interested to hear from you. Please let us know any thoughts on conflict sensitivity, how could we can work on human rights in an improved manner, and what you've seen in your work that, re that really works in this sphere. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Kathy. And that was a very brilliant presentation, uh, Anita. Um, and she's hit all of the nails on the head. And I think the, the first thing she said, and the most important thing, is that first that we must 
be aware that businesses are not neutral, even in conflict, while they're there to do business, that they're not neutral. And that, but in that sphere, that they must remain um, impartial or at least ensure that the other parties um, are able to understand that they are impartial. Um, in the context, particularly of working in Africa, or working with the African College of Corporate Accountability and um, with global rights, one of the things that you learn very fast is that conflicts are complex and they metacize over time. And so it's very important for governments and for companies uh, to devote resources to studying them, not just once, but on a continuous basis and understanding the underlying factors. And that the underlying factors a lot of times change. And that we're often caught up in old narratives while in the metamorphosis of conflict that the context has changed and then particularly governments remain the same and that businesses do not catch up on time to ensure that they respect um, human rights um, in those um, contexts. The conflicts are themselves, like I said, they are a process. They are complex, they're a process, they're metastasized, they're not a definite state. And so um, both state and non-state actors really need to pay attention to how they deal with this. And talking about state and non-state actors, but really talking about government um, and businesses. And that one of the things that you find that companies often need to deal with and also government is that victims um, become perpetrators over time and that many instances that perpetrators also become victims and that the activities of businesses can render uh, perpetrators victims as well because we often pay attention to only um, certain groups of people thinking about the context of host communities but that we fail to see that conflicts are not black and white and in the, in the shades of gray in conflict that we often need to pay attention to all of these issues um, and deal with them as they arise. And, and, and so um, governments need to um, focus on this and as well as companies. Security agencies, both public and private, are also very, very essential in this discussion, particularly security arrangements of businesses. And that when you think about the security of businesses or how um, businesses impact securities, that they, they need to develop frameworks and governments need to encourage frameworks, particularly multi-stakeholder um, frameworks to deal with security issues in conflict. Um, I think that the voluntary principles clearly helps if you would devote them. And you only need to think about what's happened in Colombia and their devotion to the voluntary principles, implementing the voluntary principles has helped to de-escalate a lot of the tension tensions um, in that country um, over time. Uh, I, and so I think that multi-stakeholder initiatives of the voluntary principles should show up in national action plans by businesses, uh, national action plans um, for um, business and human rights, and that um, national action plans need to be proactive. Now, a lot of times states totally omit dealing with um, tensions of conflict in national action plans, but then in encouraging um, human rights due diligence that we need to encourage the use of um, fragile lenses, the fragility lens to due diligence and ensure that they're able to think through um, issues. One of the things that I think that governments in, particularly in my side of the world and, and, and uh, corporations don't do as well, is engaging communities while conflicts are ongoing. Anita has spoken about engaging armed non-state actors, but then even the basics of engaging communities, um, that you find a lot of businesses will stop engaging with communities when in conflict, um, thinking that that affects their neutrality or that engaging with armed non-state actors affects their neutrality what you should be focused on or what corporations should be focused on is on their impartiality. Um, it's also very difficult for governments to understand the need for businesses. A lot of times for governments to understand the need for businesses 
to engage with armed non-state actors and, and, and think that that would be businesses choosing sites with not armed non-state actors, when in reality, it should be encouraged as part of the human rights due, um, due diligence. Um, Anita's also spoken about identifying the drivers of conflict and not just deciding what the drivers are by yourself, but then also engaging in multi-stakeholder um, consultations on these issues. When in conflict, one of the things that um, happens a lot of times is that it ends, epic ends, free prior informed consent uh, becomes a meat cell after conflict. Governments tend to think of this as part of protecting security when in fact it continues to endanger um, security and engender uh, the, the violence and the conflicts in the places that this occur. And so triggers and indicators in this instances um, fall right within due diligence um, um, machineries and in ensuring that they are able to develop and use um, toolkits that are um, essential for this. Now, for governments, you need to ensure that Governments need to ensure that the departments of government are trained on being conflict sensitive, even in business and human rights. And you would think that this will be a no brainer, but then that you find a lot of times in conflict that this is not so. And also that companies often um, withdraw very suddenly from um, communities, leaving very little thought to the impacts that they have on communities, the human rights impact of their sudden withdrawals on their staff and on the communities. I'm going to stop right here and then we could take other things in the question and answer. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Abiyadun. Um, I, I, I liked uh, your reference to some of these action be actions being no-brainers because actually this is where we need to get to. These actions are default, they're reflex, they're not something that still needs to be advocated for, given the importance and of negative impacts of failure to take action. Thanks so much. We're going to uh, move now to uh, uh, Mr. Marzuki Dawisman, who is um, who is the chair of the Foundation for International Human Rights Reporting Standards. He has had various roles in the past which have engaged on business and human rights, including being a member of Indonesia's People's Representative Council and the former, former deputy chair of the Indonesia's National Commission on Human Rights. Um, very interestingly, he's been engaged as part of Secretary General's panels of experts on uh, serious contexts like uh, Sri Lanka and Sri Lankan civil war. Um, and he's a former UN Special Rapporteur on Human Rights in North Korea, as well as having participated in the, in the international fact-finding mission in Myanmar from a Human Rights Council mandate. So really a diverse experience there on extremely complex and challenging settings in Asia. So based on all of this multiple experience and breadth of um, challenges in Asia, he's going to reflect on, on, on Anita's comments and put those in those contexts. Um, as well as um, reflecting on the work that he's doing uh, on certification within his own own work. So um, we really look forward to hearing from you today, uh, Marjorie, and thanks so much to, for joining us. Um, uh, obviously, please feel free to reflect also on your recent statements around Myanmar um, and, and, you know, opportunity to leverage and opportunities for us to demonstrate the importance of business and human rights emanating from that context. So thanks so much. The floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Katie. Uh, <clears throat> am I getting through? Uh, yes. Perfect. Yes, all right, fine, thank you. Thank you for the uh, generous introduction, uh, Katie, and uh, good evening, uh, colleagues. Uh, I take my cue uh, from, the, from Anita's uh, presentation that, uh, that businesses are not neutral. Now, uh, Katie mentioned that I had uh, done some, some work uh, on Myanmar uh, as a fact-finding mission mandated to look into the atrocities, alleged atrocities there. Uh, in the course of our uh, investigations, we came across the massive uh, business entanglements of the military with the international corporations 
and saw that uh, this was the underbelly of the regime. And so we uh, started to look into that. And uh, one thing to led to another. And finally, the report to the UN was that uh, we were calling for uh, a termination of all business uh, relations uh, with the Tatmadaw, as they call it, the armed forces there. Now, I've retired from the UN, but uh, in a way, uh, reconnected because of the recent uh, it, uh, what is this crisis there. And therefore, have started also to look again into these uh, issues of uh, business and uh, the military uh, establishment. I would say the military corporatist establishment, uh, to, be, to be more precise. And in the course of uh, the past two months, uh, we've been made uh, to understand that uh, Total, the uh, French uh, multinational corporation, which uh, does, which uh, the, the, their line of business is uh, gas and oil, have uh, looked into the uh, situation in Myanmar at the moment uh, and found it necessary to issue a public letter, which uh, was sent to us. And uh, by way of uh, referring to this letter, uh, which is signed by Mr. Patrick Puyone, the chairman and CEO of Total, could I just uh, give you a sense of uh, what uh, the uh, major companies uh, are looking at when they have to make a decision on whether or not to pull out uh, or to continue in, uh, in their operations there in, 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 a, in a conflict uh, region, a conflict uh, affected region. And therefore, uh, with, with the spirit of trying to, to uh, reconcile, if you will, you know, the, the uh, the uh, criteria and the requirements of the UNGP, uh, the, also the, uh, as mentioned earlier, the uh, conflict and development analysis of the UNDP, plus uh, also the OECD guidelines. Uh, it would seem to me that uh, a challenge would be to assist and to, in a way, uh, to encourage business to look into uh, their relations in a way that meets these requirements and therefore uh, the sense is that business are in fact looking for tools to align themselves to uh, human rights uh, norms and the UNGP and that is what may be lacking at the moment and uh, I uh, do remember recall that uh, that uh, this was uh, also uh, brought out by the uh, leader of UNDP just uh, in the in the opening remarks of developing tools uh, for business to uh, to serve as templates in their, in their consideration and, and policy uh, uh, briefs uh, in, in deciding whether or not to to stay on with certain conditions and or to pull out because of uh, the compromising uh, conditions that they face uh, and that they uh, will then uh, see that uh, it is it is uh, uh, it, it's not tenable anymore to to continue uh, uh, operations. Now, what, what is interesting, of course, is that uh, Total has uh, come up with uh, these questions, and 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 therefore, uh, having then decided that uh, they. Uh, in the interest of the uh, population there to stay on, they have proposed to uh, compensate by setting aside donations to uh, NGOs to continue the work uh, in, the, in the humanitarian uh, uh, field. Now, this is a unique way of, of uh, business uh, creating that balance between their interest and uh, their commitments to, uh, to human rights. But it does go uh, some way in, in, in indicating to us that uh, 
that uh, they do go through an internal process very seriously in looking for answers to questions that uh, they need to address whether or not to stay on or to pull out. And therefore, uh, by way of uh, just uh, highlighting this case, uh, Katie, I would propose perhaps that uh, the working group, perhaps in all of us, look into uh, both uh, the Myanmar situation and Mozambique, or, uh, as was uh, mentioned earlier, and to look into these cases uh, as a laboratory, with all due respect to the suffering that is uh, going on there, but at the same time uh, to uh, guide business and to, uh, to allow them to navigate between all these, these differing and conflicting uh, norms uh, so that uh, they have a clear picture of what is expected of them uh, on the basis of, uh, of a template that is universally uh, adhered to. And by way of just mentioning uh, uh, developing uh, templates, the Foundation for International uh, uh, Reporting Standards is engaged in, in, in developing a tool uh, which is certificate based and we believe that uh, the future of due diligence may have to consider and reconsider the use of certification as a tool for uh, guiding uh, business to align themselves with uh, the UNGPs uh, and uh, other uh, criteria uh, in developing uh, their uh, policies. Thank you. Thanks very much. I, I think it, it's particularly interesting to think about um, how also governments uh, are, are equipped to be providing the pathway for businesses as they walk through this complexity of standards and principles. And if a certification process can be a catalytic one for having governments live up to those responsibilities, that can be very useful. It'll be interesting to hear you reflect on that in the discussion. Thanks so much, Masbuki, for this presentation. I'm now going to move um, to uh, to Mark, Mark Bonzi, uh, Director of Natural Resources and Governance Division of Global Affairs Canada. We very much welcome um, having Mark here with us today. So uh, Mark is going to make reference to the voluntary principles on security and human rights, uh, which guide uh, companies in maintaining safety and security during their operations and maintaining respect for human rights within specific operating environments. Um, we, 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 it'll be good to hear from you, Mark, on how you see um, the voluntary principles as linked to good practice on human rights due diligence and how it works in terms of involving multiple stakeholders in this effort, as we just mentioned, government, civil society and businesses. I think it's the 20th anniversary um, this year of the, the voluntary principles. So if you have any reflections on what's working and what's not working, where we can do better, um, that would be really uh, helpful. And of course, under the chairmanship of, of Canada. So that's really great to have you here. Thanks so much. Over to you. Thanks so much, Katie. Uh, well, I think the first thing to say is that um, Canada for a long time has uh, endeavored to be a champion of business and human rights. Um, I think the best example uh, in this regard is uh, the fact that we've had a strategy on what we call corporate social responsibility for many, many years. Um, and it's something that's in the process of uh, being updated by our government. Um, one of the standards that we have um, addressed in, in the context of that CSR strategy, um, which is something that Canada advocates for its companies that operate abroad to implement, is the voluntary principles. And from my perspective as the, uh, uh, as the person responsible for Canada's engagement with the, the voluntary principles, um, that uh, that it that it really does reflect a good initiative uh, and a good example of how governments, business, and civil society can work together to create uh, a secure environment where human rights are respected. Um, for those uh, listening, watching who aren't uh, familiar with the voluntary principles, it is a membership-based uh, global multi-stakeholder platform. Uh, dedicated to sharing best practices and mutually supporting implementation uh, of the voluntary principles. And these principles focus on areas uh, such as risk management, uh, 
uh, risk assessment, uh, companies' uh, interaction with the public security sphere and companies' interaction with the private security sphere. And what's interesting about the voluntary principles is it creates a, a platform for being ready uh, for understanding the risks, for engaging with local communities, for engaging with security providers to both uh, identify uh, what uh, Anita said about triggers and uh, and indicators, but also um, looking at um, a broader sense of the conflict analysis, uh, the security personnel, the viewpoints of local communities, uh, the risks, uh, and and looking at it uh, in terms of in, from a company perspective, the the uh, the effect on their short term and long term operations. And uh, the, the volunteer principles creates a, a very specific standard, but um, from a government perspective, uh, because we're involved in promoting the initiative and, and trying to broaden uh, its its uh, its use and its impact, um, one of the one of the big benefits for us uh, in working with uh, the three pillar across the three pillars, uh, which are the corporate pillar, the government pillar, which Canada is the chair and of the overall initiative and the NGO pillar. Um, it's, it's that this allows the opportunity for the voluntary principles and for the initiative that, uh, that's the broadly supports it, um, that the, the, the greatest value lies in achieving collectively what, what individual companies cannot achieve on their own um, and in creating a platform for accountability and encouragement to best practice. So the VPI, uh, or the Voluntary Principles Initiative, has allowed its members to identify common interests, forge consensus, enhance accountability, and make commitments around a set of corporate responsibility and human rights issues in a way in ways that also inform the development of on-the-ground action and implementing tools and guidance to address specific issues. For example, in order to advance from commitment to impact the Voluntary Principles Initiative created five years ago in uh, in-country implementation working groups to support the critical role that local actors play as the forum for on-the-ground problem solving between local authorities, companies, and community groups. And likewise, on specific initiatives, uh, a successful example is uh, the child right is, is in the area of child rights through the child rights and security checklist. This checklist was developed a few years ago in partnership with companies and is used to supplement the, the implementation of the voluntary principles to help governments in reducing security related human rights violations against children and young people uh, around the world. The checklist is designed to help governments and companies assess the extent to which their security frameworks are attentive to and protective of children's rights. It can also be used by extractive and non-extractive companies to help identify, improve, and create greater stakeholder confidence in their protection of children's rights within their security programs. And in fact, I think this is one of the interesting things about the voluntary principles is it's not just uh, extractives. I mean, certainly the vast majority of its membership and attention is in the extractives world, uh, but it, there are potential benefits and lessons that can be drawn outside of that world as well whenever there is a, a territorial impact or uh, like a, 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 an operation site, um, it can help uh, govern those uh, or provide guidance on how to interact. But I think just looking at drawing back to Canada and, and our approach to uh, in promoting and implementing the, the volunteer principles and other, and other principles uh, such as OECD uh, guidance and, and, the, and, the, uh, and the, the UNGPs, uh, that the Mining Association of Canada, through their Towards Sustainable Mining initiative, has actually uh, asked their membership uh, to implement the voluntary principles, whether or not the company themselves are, are formally a part of the, the initiative. And um, and just looking at this checklist, for example, the uh, the members of the Mining Association of Canada, three members, have... Uh, reported that they have successfully piloted the the checklist at different mine sites. So this is you know going from theory into action. Um, so the the voluntary principles membership um, also recognizes that there are complex environments, ongoing serious risks, and growing stakeholder expectation expectations that require continuous knowledge building and the development of new tools. For this reason, Canada uh, has been supporting. 
uh, the Voluntary Principles uh, Initiative to conduct a gender analysis of the Voluntary Principles. Uh, this project will involve the development and updating of tools to ensure vulnerable groups and are considered in risk assessment and security operations. A lot of research has shown that there is a correlation between extractive projects and rising rates of gender-based violence, including on-site sexual harassment. Um, and in fact, uh, a, a big challenge with sexual and gender-based violence in these sites. And the, there's an important opportunity here to try and address that, that work. Likewise, uh, there's a need to, to also work in guidance around our capacity in the voluntary principles to protect human rights defenders and that this guidance will be developed in consultation with the broader VPI membership and looking uh, to uh, connect gender and vulnerable groups uh, in the project so that the tools developed will reflect the intersecting identities of these groups. And I, I think that just to, as a last point, um, the, that the Voluntary Principles reached its, its 20, 20th anniversary um, a few months ago um, that uh, one of the founding members of the Voluntary Principles uh, said that the, the initiative has succeeded in saving lives and protecting rights in countless situations over the years around the world. Nothing is more important for the Voluntary Principles than saving lives given its focus on security forces and conflict zones where the use of force may have life and death consequences for people in local communities as well as company personnel. Even as conflicts of varying intensity persist and human rights risks remain endemic across the world with extractive operations, there appear to have been very few fatal incidents involving volunteer principles companies over the last dozen years. So thanks for the opportunity and happy to answer any questions as they come up. Thanks so much, Mark. And thanks for the, the commitment from Canada in this regard. I think it's it's really great to welcome you here. And, and the, the emphasis on gender is also very welcome in this conversation. So I hope we can exploit that in the Q&A. Um, we are going to now hear from Ron Popper, who's a representative of the private sector. Um, he is CEO of Global Business Initiative on Human Rights and a former head of corporate responsibility at ABB Group. Um, uh, he is a trustee of the Institute for Human Rights and Business and a director for the Centre for Sport and Human Rights and teaches, teaches on this issue also. So a whole diversity of experience from Ron. Now, what he's going to be able to do is to make reference to the role that business associations can have in implementation of the guiding principles on business and human rights and, um, and reflect on the context of, uh, of conflict affected areas. So he'll be able to speak to us about um, how relevant this work has been for the members of GBI in particular, and that's going to be very useful for us to hear a little bit on the practical implications of this sets of the, the, this oh, crazy roadmap of principles and laws and regulations that we're hearing about. It would also be good to hear from you, Ron, and what would what is what are the incentives for companies in the private sector to listen to this conversation? What are the incentives to engage with it? Does awareness raising work? Does naming and shaming work? What are your perspectives on that from what you hear in, in your work? And is there anything in particular that you see the UN being able to do to help out the companies that are really genuinely concerned to adapt their behavior and do the right thing in difficult contexts like the ones we've heard about, like Myanmar, like Mozambique? Like the Sahel region, for example. Mm -hmm. So, anything you'd like to throw at us, please go ahead. It's really good to have you here. Uh, over to you. Thank you very much, Katie. Um, a pretty wide remit, uh, a palette of questions there. Uh, first of all, thank you for having me participating in this session. Um, I'll be speaking on my, um, uh, based on my own personal experience of working on corporate projects in conflict and post-conflict zones in Africa and Asia, rather than on behalf of my former company or um, the Global Business Initiative on Human Rights members. Um, Anita has already covered a number of the issues that I wanted to speak about, um, but I have two or three suggestions, humble suggestions about um, the way forward in terms of operationalizing uh, the excellent working group report. Um, and what will resonate with companies. And uh, as you said, Katie, it's important to see where uh, the UN and companies can really work rather more closely and better um, on the ground as well. 
Uh, first, I think it's important to say that while many companies are embracing the principles of the UNGPs and, and specific uh, OECD guidance, um, and due diligence is obviously a key element of that, most companies have little experience of the enhanced due diligence uh, needed in a complex environment and that the working group report has drawn attention to. Um, conflict analysis, based on my experience, needs to be the bedrock of any corporate due diligence, both before and after a company uh, decides to enter a fragile environment. We had a, a briefing at the Global Business Initiative last week on, on conflict analysis, and we were reminded that um, conflict analysis actually needs to come before due diligence, uh, and I very much agree with that. Uh, having that kind of um, background will change or add substance to the questions that you subsequently ask in a due diligence process uh, and render it more meaningful uh, and effective. Um, so if I look forward and say, well, what's next after, the, uh, after this excellent report by the, by the working group? Um, I'm very happy to hear that one of the intentions is to create a, a widely available tool which draws on and includes traditional corporate due diligence questions, but then adds a separate layer uh, of conflict analysis, uh, namely the kind of questions the company needs to be seeking answers to from a com conflict sensitive perspective. Uh, obviously any kind of generic tool can be adapted for local circumstances. Um, I think that if the UN and a group of experienced companies and other actors, including civil society, collaborate on an enhanced due diligence mechanism, the take up um, providing it's practical for business uh, will be surprising and the results will be beneficial. Maybe we're actually talking about a set of tools rather than just one. Um, if I look at the issue of uh, site level grievance mechanisms, um, many currently, if they exist at all, many of them take a rather binary approach to problem solving, uh, which may play out badly in a sensitive environment. Um, and as the working group report suggests, there may need to be uh, developed uh, an operational level, level grievance mechanism that have a conflict sensitive approach. Um, so we're, maybe we're looking at a, a palette of tools here. Um, some of which may already exist. I mean, if, if, if you go and speak to some of the extractives uh, that have a lot of experience of working in uh, conflict environments and are there for several decades necessarily as part of their work, uh, they may already have their own uh, enhanced due diligence questionnaires. Whatever is produced as a result of the work with the UNDP, it has to be fit for purpose uh, um, for business or else it's a non-starter. Um, so I think the next steps must be much more active collaboration between the UN uh, and companies in areas of conflict. Uh, most companies, as they do their risk mapping and seek information about a complex environment, for them, uh, the UN's a missing partner. It's generally not a reflex by companies to turn to the UN for analysis and advice although it does sometimes happen. But as I say, the UN's a missing partner, and I think it's a missed opportunity on both sides. Um, it seems as though there's an obvious bridge to cross here, uh, which is beneficial to everybody, I think. On the one side, uh, as part of peace building, UN agencies seem to need a, a stronger remit to exchange with companies on the ground to share conflict analysis but also to obtain valuable information from companies themselves. And on the other hand, companies need to know that the UN is available uh, to provide conflict analysis and impartial support information. So an obvious next step seems to be to set up some pilot projects to show the benefits to both parties of exchanges in conflict and post-conflict zones or areas. And I think the UNDP is well placed to act as a convener, a door opener to valuable insights and other available UN resources. Once this bridge has been crossed, once, once 
it is known that such information is a, is accessible. I, I think we're all going to be very surprised at the corporate response, uh, even from some unexpected quarters. I think state-owned enterprises, as well as private corporations and some of the larger SMEs, uh, would be a good target audience. And I suggest that a way of to open up these avenues is both convenings on the ground uh, and also briefings in key capitals, both on the finding of the UN Working Group report, um, but also on what constitutes uh, enhanced due diligence and conflict analysis. And I think finally, there's, there's another avenue um, that needs to be explored more thoroughly. Um, and that's working through home state embassies. Uh, and I believe that could be much more effective. It's one of the things that I've seen working on the ground um, in recent years, namely that uh, home state governments are using their embassies much more to, to inform about business and human rights um, and uh, what the expectations are of uh, company performance. Um, I think it's built into many of their naps and so forth, and I think that's a real opportunity. So if I take a, a, take a, a snapshot of, 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 of what I think needs to happen now, three very quick conclusions, three suggestions. One, the development of tools, yes, uh, adding conflict sensitivity into traditional corporate due diligence, and that includes trying them out in, in different locations. Two, uh, increased contact on the ground between the UN and companies to raise awareness of the working group's report and to provide the kind of conflict analysis that companies really need to strengthen their ability to operate in respect of human rights. And finally, three, um, increased collaboration and dissemination through home state governments uh, and their embassies. I think those are three recommendations that uh, uh, I would make. Uh, happy to answer any questions in a little while. Thank you. Thanks so much, Ron, and thanks for the succinct uh, recommendations. I think that's very useful, particularly those that land in our agreement um, around the role of the UN and dissemination and support um, in terms of learning and, uh, and implementation. Um, I have in the in the we have in the comments a number of different interesting questions and points which are, I'm, I'm trying to group here. But what I, so what I would like to do is if I could invite the panelists to take a look through the comments in the chat, and you will see uh, the types of thematics that are coming up, and then I'll, I will navigate uh, the conversation with you. But what I would like to do, first of all is to come back to Anita. Uh, and ask Anita if you have any reflections also on what you've just heard. Perhaps you could start also by hitting on the questions you see within the chat box, which are around um, risks to human rights uh, defenders. Human rights defenders, as we all know, are, are I think, extremely complicated and extremely uh, challenging, dangerous times in the last year, year and a half. It's been an up the depression of human rights defenders. So do consultation for of the type of discussing of the broad um, work that's involved in conflict analysis that's involved in human rights uh, due to the, are we at risk of exposing those defenders in such in, in this process and what can we do to best protect um there's also a sort of questions there around um uh, the thoughts around the binding treaty and i thought it might be interesting to hear your reflections on that as you as you hit and otherwise uh, i'll come back to navigate with some sort of background noise that I'm thinking, so just bagging that to the directors, otherwise I'm passing that over to Anita. Great, thank you so much, Katie. Um, my reflections, I just wanna thank all of the discussants for their very constructive and useful recommendations on the ways forward from thinking about Myanmar and actually looking at what companies are trying to do in real time 
as actual pilots to issues again of thinking about how we begin as a prevention with risk assessment and, and conflict assessment before we engage in human rights due diligence. I've taken copious notes about all of the different examples and I think the voluntary principles are really again a good practice where we can look and see what has worked in this context that we can use in others. So I want to just reflect on a couple of other things. The question about human rights defenders that came up in the comments section is a very important one. And it was actually nested in a broader question of, well, consultation in very dangerous and complex environments with the true stakeholders is not always possible. And we're seeing this in any number of settings now. This is a challenge for business. And we have to acknowledge that while consultation is the bedrock of engagement, and, and part of the guiding principles. When we have a situation of conflict, what we have hope has happened and what business has done much earlier is engaged in consultation and thinking through human rights, due diligence and impact uh, well before there are issues of conflict. So that is, I think, our first message, which is that you have to engage and think about these issues before there's a conflict context. But in the situation where, where consultation becomes riskier, then there are issues around how to best engage. And this is where we would say the working group is actually about to launch in June new guidance on the guiding principles and their application as companies and states think about risks to defenders and to communities at risk. Um, what should that look like? And human rights due diligence that actually has a human rights defender lens and a lens of uh, risk of reprisal and retaliation is yet another layer. But what I would say there is that it's important for companies not only to talk to NGOs and CSOs that may know a region or an area, it's also important for them to engage actively with organizations that work with defenders that know issues around security protocols. How do you engage in consultation? Even issues around what kind of, of, of app should you use? Is it signal? Is it secure? Uh, is there going to be a, a leak, a criminal violation if somebody communicates with you over a certain channel or downloads an app? These are all things that I think we don't always think about. So there's another group of, of organizations that we need to embrace, and that is the organizations that work with defenders, that work with groups, that think about safety and security and all kinds of protocols, because I think this is a very vital issue. So we'll address some of these in our, in, in our, um, in our guidance, and, and I'll look forward to hearing um, from the other discussants on other topics that were raised. Thanks. Thanks, Anita. Um, Mark, you wanted to jump in also on this question around human rights defenders, I believe. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think uh, to, to answer the question specifically, uh, it, it was, uh, as I understand it, it's about uh, how do companies ensure meaningful consultation while minimizing risk of doing harm? And uh, I think one of the one of the things that can be done looking at the voluntary principles as an example is uh, make doing this work, making this consultation, making this engagement a standard practice so that if a company is operating in a in a space that that this is just what's expected um, and that uh, it surprises nobody when the company is being very inclusive uh, in their engagement with local communities and and defenders. And um, in this regard, then then it, it, it isn't um, uh, something that comes <laughs> that's not it's not an unusual thing, and, and uh, this ties in as well with the analysis that I that I mentioned earlier about the importance of doing uh, gender analysis, the importance of doing that within an intersectional context. That is looking at different identities that people ha may have, and how that may uh, might make things more challenging for them. Uh, ethnic minorities, um, uh, d uh, level of ability. Um, uh, language barriers, um, a, a level of income, uh, lots of different intersecting uh, areas that can that can add to discrimination beyond gender, but uh, but looking at gender as well, um, and as well layering on a human rights analysis and looking at how can we ensure that uh, that there's no harm being done. So the companies can do all of this work, do the analysis, engage with stakeholders, make it a best practice, make it part of their basic way of doing business, and. I, I pointed out that the Mining Association of Canada has done this with uh, through its towards sustainable mining, and and it's an approach that's been adopted in many other countries as well. 
Uh, thanks, Mark. Uh, did you have any reflections on Ron's point about the use of, uh, of uh, home-based embassies? Is that something that Canada has been has been investing in? How, are you working through your own embassies to promote these views? And do you see that change? Is there an uptick in or change in behavior as a result? Well, well, certainly when it comes to Canada, our, our trade commissioner service is very active in, in promoting responsible business conduct uh, globally. Uh, in fact, um, reflecting the, 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 the standards and approaches that, that Canada has recommended to Canadian companies is uh, a condition for receiving trade commissioner support services, which is a really important tool for a lot of companies to be engaging uh, in, in international trade. So I would say, yes, it's very important. Uh, Canada is right on the ground acting. Um, and that's just when it comes to dealing with businesses. But I think there's also an important role uh, in dealing with uh, working with human rights defenders, uh, things that we do, for example, supporting them through our Canada Fund for Local Initiatives at, at, at the embassy level. Um, and, and as well uh, in, in international assistance practice to, to actually build the capacity of, uh, of human rights defenders and deal with the underlying uh, uh, issues, be they in a, in a conflict setting specifically or more broadly to build institutions to promote human rights. Thanks, thanks Mark for those reflections. Uh, I, I want to just summarize, we have a cluster of questions around uh, concrete examples of how companies can engage in transitional justice processes. I think that also begs the question of whether there can be transitional justice exercises which are centered on the actions of the private sector also. So I might throw that one at Anita down the line, but I'd like to invite also the other panelists. There's a set of questions on the role of uh, investors and whether guidance on investment or the power of investors is particularly in the environment and social domain could actually could actually drive change or whether there's a risk in terms of investment being if you like a blue washing or a green washing of standards it's too superficial an engagement to really change behaviors of the private sector so it'd be very interesting to hear from any of you on that there's another set of questions on whether we have an overload, a guidance overload. Is there a, question, a, a questionnaire principles law guidance overload? And is, are we at risk because of competing disciplines of confusing the key stakeholders rather than really providing them with um, a solid uh, and to, an, uh, to the extent we can binding uh, guidance on how they should be behaving? This is often, there's often a discourse challenge, obviously, is different communities work together. I think that Ron also referred to that. So do, do, do any of the panelists have any reflection on it? Um, we have a set of questions also around uh, IFIs, the role of uh, international financial institutions. It's in a way linked to investment, uh, but there's a specific question about whether we know of any cases of where IFIs, such as the IMF or the World Bank, have, have pulled out because of human rights due diligence concerns in terms of their own investment. Um, I am inviting the panelists to jump in and reflect on those areas. Um, but firstly, Anita, you wanted to just jump back on the question of the treaty. I think. Yeah. yeah, just very briefly to say the working group, I mean, the treaty process is an intergovernmental process, so the working group is, is on the side at the Human Rights Council, but we do provide our input and guidance. Our main role is to ensure that whatever comes out of that process that is consistent with and doesn't water down the commitments of the guiding principles. In the meanwhile, we're focused on the active national implementation and, and regional implementation of the guiding principles, because again, a treaty process can take a longer period of time. So while that we advise, but of course it's the role of states to negotiate that. Yeah, thanks so much. Um, Abby Adon, I, I wanted to, as you were the first uh, to speak, I wanted to invite you to see if you'd like to hit on any, any of these questions. I think, uh, um, I, I know that you had a, a set of points you wanted to bring up in the conversation. So please, please welcome to take the floor. Um, maybe I should just uh, try and go to the uh, transitional justice um, issue um, and how difficult this is in a lot of contexts and, and that except if you have um, a context in which uh, home governments are also very vested um, in the process and not just uh, leaving the companies and um, the, the, the conflict-ridden state which, which often has very uh, poor institutions and that the, the problem with transitional justice in this instance is that 
it, it's very, very difficult to build um, uh, guidelines for that because the context in each one is quite different. Uh, but then that guidelines to help build guidelines might just be the way to go. And, and I know um, you're very wary of uh, additional guidelines all of the time. But then the thing about guidelines is also ensuring that there's a sync to them and ensuring that they work um, in the context in which um, we've, we've also found ourselves. Uh, another point I wanted to make, and, and, and it didn't come up in the questions, are also that conflicts are morphing and they're changing. Um, and that traditional conflicts, um, we now have the extra layer of um, terrorism, uh, terrorism, particularly um, in the Middle East and uh, on the continent of Africa. I think of the country from which I come, Nigeria, and that that's a major issue in that the, the, the proliferation of this actors and using the proceeds of business, particularly through kidnaps and, and things like that, are also extra um, tensions that governments and businesses um, have to deal with in, in our context. Uh, and also that we need, also need to think about conflict and insecurity in other instances. Um, in Nigeria recently was the NSAS movement, which, in which businesses, particularly telecoms, were implicated in government um, abuses of human rights um, of citizens. And that those contexts are not quite conflict, but then that you're caught in the space of the civic spaces being shrunk and business has been implicated um, in those tensions between um, citizens and governments. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thanks. Thank you for those reflections. I think that the, the, you're you're really hitting on some of these the, these acute challenges um, of experiencing the change in nature of conflict and of how we work and interact with the different actors who are actually internationally labeled criminals um, as terrorists in, in the different contexts that we're working with. And therefore, it's hard. Uh, it's hard for the UN and for any actors to have interaction with those groups um, as they're not forming necessarily a traditional combatant group as we would have understood it under humanitarian law. Um, I want to jump over to Mazuki because we have a set of questions around the role of companies in uh, Myanmar. Um, a couple of points coming out there. One is around the complexity of whether foreign companies by pulling out are also risking the jobs and livelihoods of the very same people who are demanding or pro demand. So what, what is the guidance? And what is the response? What, what is your response to how foreign companies should respond in this situation and whether the protesters have to decide between jobs uh, and peace and democracy? Um, the separate question for you on the role of total um, in in the chat there. I think I'm just going to just quickly ask you, you could maybe jump on the question of Myanmar and I'll, I'll come back to you on the other. Should I? Please. Jump in now. Okay, fine. Yes. Thank Katie. Thank you. Yes, I noted the, the questions and uh, I, uh, I'm looking at the the uh, discussions here in, from the from a vantage point of uh, combining uh, approaches but at the same time taking into account uh, the the realities the concrete realities that uh, corporations are facing uh, on the ground and uh, introducing the uh, issue of uh, the case of total uh, helps helps us to get a sense of the the materiality of the issues that uh, the, these corporations have to face by looking at some of the questions they have have had to address. For example, should we halt the current gas well drilling uh, campaign? And and this relates to uh, your point about uh, investors. Uh, now, the answer that Total gave to that question was that they will not be continuing their investments there if the situation continues as it, as it is now. Now, uh, there are a host of uh, questions uh, uh, brought out uh, in, the, in the Total letter, but uh, I, I'd like to relate this also to what Ron was saying about uh, 
uh, the uh, conflict analysis and, and related also to what uh, uh, Mark was saying about the VBSH. Uh, the issue of uh, conflict analysis, I think, is, is strategic. It is, is in fact, uh, primary. And I was mulling over uh, this point whether or not uh, the uh, conflict analysis uh, needs to be grafted onto the UNGPs, or do we see this as uh, as an overall context of uh, companies having to uh, assess uh, whether or not uh, to continue or to pull out? And so I think uh, it, it's it's uh, relevant, you know, to really address this issue, and and therefore. Uh, bringing this up as a as a tool that companies should uh, uh, try to uh, to use in, in in aligning themselves with the with uh, human rights norms and, and therefore uh, again uh, katie i i come back to this issue of uh, of citizen uh, as a tool to uh, create comparability among uh, uh, corporations in their policies to align themselves with human rights uh, uh, norms. Uh, the use of, of, of these kinds of tools uh, uh, are uh, very practical in the sense that uh, by, by building on uh, their policies, uh, they uh, get on on this journey uh, of, of uh, eventually uh, reaching that point where uh, aligning their companies with the human rights norms uh, reach reach a high point, and and therefore uh, these questions uh, that surround uh, decisions that uh, companies have to made to make uh, coming out from conflict uh, affected uh, areas. Uh, could have the purpose, as, as uh, uh, I think Ron was saying, a pilot project, I use the term laboratory, to assist uh, companies in uh, making the first decision, and that is whether or not they are in a position to leverage the governments of the country they are operating in to align themselves and to stop the atrocities that they are committing. Is that... Uh, a, a point that uh, that, that merits uh, our attention, because the UNGPs uh, do not use the word uh, the word disengagement. It, it uses the word uh, uh, termination or, 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 or pulling out in, in a way. You know, and so there is this this phase between having to assess and to make a decision to disengage or to terminate where the companies need guidance in how to uh, finally make that decision to pull out by uh, initially uh, going through the process of how to leverage the governments so that uh, their obligations to respect and the responsibility to respect human rights is uh, made, made clear to the government and uh, if they, they are not able to leverage uh, a change in conduct, then they would then have to make a decision whether to leave or not. But the initial, initial phase of, of uh, having to face a situation in a uh, uh, conflict-affected area is to make that first move to leverage the governments to, to uh, uh, change their conduct uh, in terms of their uh, 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 committing atrocities in the in the in the country. Mazuki, thanks very much. I want to quickly, due to time, I just want to quickly get let Ron have a chance to jump in on the, the issues that have been heard around investors, around certification, around pulling out, and also around this issue of livelihoods versus principle. Um, it's a lot, Ron. I know. So if I could give you a couple of minutes. <laughs> It is a lot. Let me just, if you, if you will, zero in on um, one one particular aspect: um, investors. Uh, and I, I think one of the really welcome changes in the, in this space over the last 
three to five years has been the, the, the awakening of the investment community to, uh, to, to uh, human rights, before the human rights performance of companies and, and the need to build that into their business models. Um, time was uh, when investors were really very, very controversy based. They were, they were, their models were really controversy based and, and some of them still are. Um, but a goodly number of them uh, are now moving in the right direction uh, to take a closer look at what human rights policies and practices of a, a company has in place, um, how they're dealing with challenges, including working uh, in, in conflict zones, uh, and how they're, how they're seeking solutions to, to the dilemmas that they, they face. And I think this awakening of the, of the investment community to... Uh, understanding uh, and factoring in the the impacts, positive and negative, uh, of a company um, in in all kinds of environments, including uh, conflict zones, uh, is, is one of the really welcome um, changes that I've seen over the last five to seven years. Uh, time was that this was just the remit of, of socially responsible investment funds. But now we're seeing a great deal more activism. Uh, we've seen it in Australia with, with, with uh, Rio Tinto. We've seen it in Malaysia uh, with, with the gloves and, 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 and many other places. So I think that the uh, investors are, are really wakening up uh, to the fact that they need to factor in uh, human rights performance. And I think it's only heading in one direction because um, with the increase of mandatory human rights due diligence that we're seeing not just in the European Union, but also in Mexico and, 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 and other places, um, this is going to need to be part of their business models going forward. And investors are, are one of the groups of people, one of the stakeholders that CEOs and C-suite people really listen to. Thanks, Ron. It's really helpful to end with all of those concrete examples, you know, to, to bring us back to reality. That's really, really helpful. I'm very mindful of the time. Uh, this is a rich discussion. It's a broad set of issues and uh, the great report has prompted that, but this is by no means the end of this conversation. We'll be convening this conversation several times over the next year uh, in UNDP to define our own course of action in this domain. We are committed to enhancing uh, our work and to broadening the global scope of what we're doing in this domain. I want to thank all of you for your great presentations today, for participating in this really important conversation. In order to wrap up finally, I'm going to hand off the floor to Anita briefly. I think you have a couple of minutes, Anita, and then to Asako, who will just say some final words and close the session. Thanks to everybody for being here. Thanks for staying online and your active participation. Great. Thank you so much, Katie. And again, thank you to UNDP for hosting this important conversation. It's a next step. We need to do much more. I just want to flag again that there are many issues we still need to address from transitional justice and access to remedy to the issue of armed non-state groups. So my only call here is a call to action for everyone. The working group intends to continue its work and we would hope that we would do so in partnership with everyone and all the stakeholders represented today. So thank you so much again. Thank you, uh, Anita, and thank you all participants. Uh, the, uh, uh, the questions are great, and then the conversation uh, really shows that uh, we need a lot more to unpack. Uh, and as uh, Katie has mentioned, that uh, we, as a UNDP, intend to hold a series of conversations uh, in the months and the, the weeks to come, uh, and then to work uh, together uh, with uh, you, all of you participants. Um, uh, I, uh, so uh, some comments that uh, how can business engage in this conversation? Please spread the, uh, the awards around the, the, that the, uh, we are taking uh, the um, uh, um, initiative to have this conversation. We will work together closely with UN Working Group and, and then the, uh, all the business and human rights community and we want to expand even farther on. So please uh, spread the words around uh, the, the initiative that we are taking. So thank you, everyone, uh, for your participation, and uh, we look forward to seeing you in the conversation to come. Thank you, everybody. Have a good day and the rest of the week. <laughs>